آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ So I'm here with Sergei Popov, um, who is an astrophysicist at Moscow State University. Um, and we're here today to discuss recent um, proposed amendments to Russia's education law, which would be highly restrictive to um, academic freedom, international cooperation in the sphere of science, um, and would have a chilling effect on free speech. Um, and so I'd like to invite Sergei to um, introduce us to what these amendments are. Okay, these uh, amendments uh, appeared uh, from a group of um, members of the parliament uh, of the Russian State Duma and uh, of the um, Federal Council, which is an uh, analogous of Senate. And um, the, this group, uh, they actually worked on several proposals, all of them successfully became laws. Um, several proposals related to um, foreign influence in Russia. Um, so there were many laws related to so-called foreign agents. And um, these, uh, this set of um, amendments is, um, in my opinion, is a byproduct of um, this um, approach which on one hand, and this is more general, um, starts from the idea that if anything exists, then it might be regulated by the state law. And really they use this approach in their um, rhetorics, because when you ask them, why do we need uh, these new parts of um, the law related to education, they say, well, um, there are many people doing popular science and they're not regulated on the federal level. So this is something we uh, cannot um, afford. Uh, we, if, the, if there is something we have to regulate, that, that's one idea. And uh, another idea is related to this foreign influence, because um, uh, this is all this in many countries it's very fruitful idea uh, to find some enemies outside and to start to fight with them even if uh, these enemies are um, more or less elusive and uh, um, but it um, i'll say it takes attention of um, public from really important questions uh, to something uh, which is easier to discuss on TV in different mass media and so on and so on. Um, and would you mind sort of um, describing some of the specifics of the amendments? I know that you were saying, I think one of the sort of most shocking um, mm -hmm. proposals is that people have to get permission yeah. before they can present a lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are four amendments and um, they have very different um, characters, I would say. One is very direct and clear. It, um, it says um, that any educational organization, so in, in Russia, if you do something related to real education, so there is an education, um, there is a program, you uh, provide some kind of diploma at the end. Uh, so this is a well regulated, um, you have to obtain license and the, the statement educational organization is uh, very well defined. So all these educational organizations from elementary schools up to um, top universities might ask for permission in advance before they sign any contract with foreign organization or uh, with a foreigner, just with a um, private person. Uh, and this is very direct and clear, and uh, it's very easy to criticize it because definitely if any contracts are signed, then afterwards um, they, they are published, they are sent to um, different officials, and it's very easy to control the whole thing happening. And finally, foreigners are coming, <laughs> they have to obtain visa and so on. So, Actually, uh, I don't think that um, there are any 
problems related to it. And um, I don't think that any educational organization, mostly they are state organizations, uh, not maybe on the federal level, but um, they get money from the budget, the state budget, the local budget, and uh, they, they don't want to have problems. So I think they carefully avoid signing any um, wrong contracts, let's say. And um, also, um, so if it happens, uh, then of course many things would be um, difficult to do. It will take a long time because you have to send documents to Moscow. They have to look at them months pass. And uh, if you are organizing a summer school, then of course it's much more difficult than to gather people. Okay, so this statement is a, a little bit separate. Uh, the rest three, they are related to, um, to um, it's a difficult thing to find the proper word. Uh, so in, in Russia, um, for this educational activity, uh, we use uh, the word with the root enlightenment. Um, more or less, it's close to popular science and public outreach. But also, it can bring a little bit more. So if you give a lecture about, I don't know, um, literature in some country it's not actually popular science it's not public outreach but it brings uh, more humanitarian aspects uh, which are well fitted with this word enlightenment um, but um, it sounds i think strange for english-speaking people to use this word to this part of activity so still uh, three uh, are related to this type of activity and the first just gives a definition and uh, they found a very funny definition, which is broad, broad, broad. It takes everything. So any exchange of information actually um, is uh, inside this definition. So not only lectures, not only popular articles or whatever, articles, books, everything, um, videos on YouTube, and even uh, I would say private talks because formally it is inside this uh, definition. So the wording is, well, in, in some sense proper <laughs> because it includes everything. Uh, so um, of course, in, in general, uh, in writing laws and specifically in Russia, I would say people have to avoid such broad definitions because it's very difficult to use them in real practice because then everything becomes uh, this type of activity. We always exchange information. People keep talking because they want to exchange not only emotions, but also information, maybe in the first place even. Uh, so for uh, emotions, we also have mimics, but it's much more difficult to exchange information with just mimics. So uh, the first one is just this broad definition. Then uh, there is uh, something like um, the sky is blue, the grass is green. It just says you, that you cannot use this type of activity uh, for hate speech uh, to promote any um, I don't know, violence. Um, your talks might not be offensive and so on and so on. Actually, uh, well, nobody is against, of course. The, the problem is that it's already written in many, many laws. And uh, why uh, specifically we have to write it here? So uh, it's like um, there are many laws uh, about, I don't know, people don't have to kill other people. But then appears a special law in which it said that red hair people should not kill other people. I mean, it's all right, they, they should not, of course. But really, I start to feel, um, no, I start to be afraid of the uh, destiny of red-haired people in such a country. Uh, and finally, the third uh, just says that actual uh, regulation um, will be defined by some future laws written by, um, Ministry of Education, Minister of Science, and so on, so on. So, so there are several uh, official organizations regulating different parts of this activity, Ministry for Cultural Activity, and so on. Uh, and that, that's it. So uh, on one hand, there is nothing direct inside it, um, but uh, it just opens the door 
to uh, many additional laws and if they are written by ministries, then they're not really laws. They can be instructions for educational organizations, for example. And it means that they will just work as they are. And at first they work. And then if you are unhappy, you go to, to a court and start to discuss the problem, but only afterwards. So um, that's it. That's the situation we face. Um, can you speak a bit to the public reaction? Because you started a change.org pe petition that's gotten well over 200,000 signatures, which is fairly rare in Russia. Um, so this has seemed to lead to some public outcry. Is that, um, what do you think the prospect of that is? Uh, yeah, and this is just one part of the story. Uh, really in the last 20 years, maybe, maybe slightly less, um, especially this popular science activity became very widespread in Russia. It became quite popular. Um, Nonfiction books are, are written, translated, published, and uh, sold. Um, there are many lectures on YouTube. There are many lectures which people just visit or want to visit. Uh, of course, in Moscow, it's much more easier to go to such a lecture than in a small city somewhere. Um, and uh, indeed, there are many people who are interested in it. And if they feel that something can happen with their, I don't know, favorite YouTube channels about science, they, of course, are ready to sign a petition. Uh, but maybe what is more important, however, it's difficult to say what is more important here, but um, it's important that uh, several um, professional um, not societies, so let's say several different groups of professionals um, became uh, very unhappy about uh, this proposal. And uh, these groups are scientists on one side and the um, Russian Academy of Science uh, made several official statements about it. And they are really unhappy that um, up to now deputies absolutely ignored their outcry. And uh, it, um, it puts uh, on the schedule many questions about the role of science in Russia. Because if you have scientists and we, we have them, um, then you have to respect them and ask them about important questions, especially in the field uh, they're deeply involved in. And uh, that's one thing. Then there are um, lots of people doing this popular science or public outreach activity and so on. And they also uh, made their own say, declaration with uh, thousands of signatures. And this is different. It's not like 1,000 here and 100,000 there. Uh, here, 1,000 means that uh, it's really a signature professor that, that, that from that university. Um, so it's a serious sign that this professional society is also unhappy. And uh, there was uh, also a letter, uh, a letter to the president by a group of um, people working in the in the field of cultural activities, uh, especially people working in museums, because they make lots of excursions. And it's not like they have this exposition for three centuries, and the, uh, the excursion was approved by any emperor in the Russian history already. There are many new expositions, and they uh, really worry what they have to do with this, how they can rapidly invite people related to the um, very rapid forms of activity. So yeah, in, in general, we have uh, negative reactions by different um, groups of professionals and we have a wide uh, negative reaction by the public. And it's interesting because these people are not generally political. It's not sort of like just the opposition that is speaking out against it. It's people who are, you know, a apolitical. So in what sense is this turning people who would otherwise be apolitical into sort of more political. Um, yeah, even I would say people who are very uh, pro-government, uh, they are also not very happy about it. And uh, uh, they can say something, well, in general, of course, we have to fight against this foreign uh, influence yet, but <laughs> not in such a crazy way, something like this. And maybe um, it's important to um, notice uh, that 
uh, in the parliament, in the Russian parliament, there are four parties, but one is absolutely dominating. Uh, but it looks like three other parties uh, will vote against um, this proposal. Um, so uh, I would say that in the Russian parliament, there is no real opposition. Maybe communists form somehow in a position in several aspects, but generally it's not so, it, it looks like they, they don't want to get power actually. Um, but still even uh, there inside the United Russia, um, there are deputies uh, who are um, against these amendments. And uh, the, the, the brightest illustration was that um, the deputy Paklonskaya, uh, who initially signed uh, this um, proposal, but I think she was not um, one of actual authors. Uh, but then she um, called back her signature from this proposal, saying that she uh, say foresees, uh, she predicts that there'll be negative public reaction and maybe they don't need these laws so that much that especially now in the year of parliament elections, they have to um, make another wave of um, say negative reaction to what the United Russia does. So do you think, uh, so they'll be voting on it on, it, it'll go through the second round reading on March 9th, um, correct? Yeah. Um, and so, do you, do you think there's a chance that it that this sort of public outcry will stop it from passing? Um, frankly, now not. So I thought that it would be possible before the last discussion in the parliament committee. Um, but what happened on this committee uh, shows that maybe it'll pass with uh, minor changes at most. And if uh, this uh, law can be stopped, it can be stopped now, not in the parliament. Uh, it can be stopped in the <clears throat> Council of Federation maybe, or formally uh, the president can, um, can not sign, can <laughs> don't sign. Yeah, he can refuse to put his signature on the law. Because um, in the parliament, it looks like even, um, those votes from the United Russia, even 90% of votes from the United Russia would be enough uh, for this uh, amendments to pass. Um, and what concrete effect do you think this is gonna have on your work and sort of the development of science and free flow of information um, in ways that are really sort of not political, but that just sort of for the sake of science, there needs to be open discussion and communication across borders. Uh, so I think that because of this, um, of the fourth uh, amendment uh, about uh, contracts with uh, foreign organizations and um, persons, um, there'll be really less, uh, less invitations. So less um, foreign professors and summer schools in just in universities and uh, less, I don't know, teachers with uh, native speakers with foreign language in schools, maybe. Um, that would be one thing. Uh, about the rest, we have to see what actually uh, different ministries um, write uh, about um, all these matters. Um, because uh, at the moment, it's unclear because it looks like nobody of them really want to do something about it. They, they don't look very happy. Um, it looks like they cannot just reject it. Uh, they, they have to, to, to approve, to, to agree to follow this line. And um, then we have to see. But I think uh, that most probably um, these um, these restrictions uh, will be put, not say in a general way, um, but particularly against some specific um, organizations. They, they can be museums, they can be um, uh, lectoriums, I don't just groups of people. Um, and um, so mostly maybe 
people will not feel it directly. But what is important that uh, people feel the general atmosphere of what is happening. And uh, typically, if uh, there is some, uh, there are some restrictions of such a general, um, with such general features, then um, occasionally uh, anybody can be just randomly uh, caught by this. Um, regulations and um, people will use, I will say, internal censorship uh, to mm, maybe just to, to speak less about something or maybe completely to cancel their activity moving to um, some other fields. Because typically people doing uh, popular science or all this type of activity, it's not their main job. So I'm a university professor. Sometimes I'm giving popular lectures or, read, uh, or write books or uh, make videos and so on. If there'll be some um, real complications and limitations, for me, it will be easier just to stop it. And I know that for many people, that would be the easiest escape. Um, that, of course, would be um, very sad because in the last few years, we really developed uh, quite, uh, even I would say unique, um, um, uh, what would be the word, ecosystem of uh, this popular science, uh, because still the, um, the organization of science and, and education in Russia is different from what we see in Western Europe or in States. Um, and uh, many people working in science, uh, academics or working in um, uh, universities as lecturers and so on, they have um, more, well, freedom uh, in a sense, they have more free time, I would say, uh, to, to make this type of activity. Um, and uh, that's why uh, in, in Moscow, for example, I, I think uh, I cannot compare with states, but I definitely can compare with Europe. It's much more easy if you just want to have a lecture of some top specialist in, I don't know, general relativity, genetics, or quantum mechanics, it's very easy to organize it. Many people would uh, react very positively on such invitations. You can make it, make video, put it on the web, and uh, it costs nearly nothing. Um, so probably we'll see less of this type of activity. Um, was this law the sort of the first um, example of um, attempts to restrict popular science or have there been other sort of um, societal pressures that have chilled free speech within uh, both popular science communities as well as if you could speak since you're also a university professor to sort of the state of academic freedom in the university right now? Um, well, uh, actually, maybe I'm not the perfect, a perfect person to be asked about it because um, one needs a broader view. Um, because the uh, situation, uh, as I suspect, is very different in different places. And um, I never Personally, I never faced uh, any uh, real problems uh, with uh, what I'm saying in my lectures, even if they are recorded. Um, however, I know that in many places, um, this can be a problem. And um, so the, the situation is a little bit tricky, I would say, about it. And, um, Typically, it's uh, as I see it. So it's very um, personal, very subjective view. Uh, as I see it, uh, people typically face problems if they um, are involved in some um, oppositional activity, and it somehow appears in what they are doing uh, inside academics. So they can, uh, I know. I would say most of good lecturers, they uh, you know, make jokes during a lecture because to, to catch the attention of students for an hour and a half, you, you have sometimes to entertain them. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult. And uh, this can involve something, some 
political satirics comments uh something like that and people have problems with that definitely people in humanitarian science or in social science mm, can have more problems and uh, 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 there were several scandals i would say when contracts were not prolonged so it's not like people were fired but just uh, in russia it's quite typical that we prolong our contracts sometimes even every year so i'm working in the university as a scientist i'm working for how many more than 20 years now and uh still as a scientist i um, prolong my contract every five years but as a professor i do it every year uh, so it's very easy just to not to stop a contract but not to make a new one with me and uh, there were several cases when new contracts were not signed um, or well, there were several cases when uh, people um, deeply involved in political activity just uh, really signed by themselves because they realized that uh, they occasionally can harm people just around them. So the whole department can feel um, pressure from the uh, university officials. So um, th there are problems with this type of activity. Uh, maybe in some places there can be problems really with um, professional activity, but for me at the moment it's difficult, I mean, from my memory to uh, tell you an example. Thanks. Um, and do you know, uh, sort of pr from the perspective of the students, um, if this is something that they're concerned about or if they are sort of affected by um, these proposals to restrict academic freedom? Is that of concern to them? um yeah th this is a good question um in my opinion uh, students are not very active um, in well in general students in my opinion are not very active in i wanted to say political sense but it, it can be unrelated to really big politics so they just uh, very often follow the flow and uh, uh, don't try to to do something um so uh, definitely my students will when i talk to them uh, they they ask me how is going on with this um with these amendments and um but uh, i don't see any specific activity in it. like um, i told you that several professional group groups of professionals uh, they um, made uh, clear signs from um, their sites and uh, i didn't see uh, that from students of course there are small groups uh, there is a very interesting students journal doxa and uh, they wrote about this problem maybe even from the very beginning because this um, proposal appeared in november and uh, i think even at the end of the last year they already uh, wrote about this problem um, there are several other but relatively small uh, maybe well visible but small um, groups of students who uh, understand that this can be a problem because typically, uh, in general, I would say in Russia, people can be very, uh, I would say, not, not ignorant, but uh, feel very easy about any new laws. Um, because uh, there is a proverb, I don't know how it sounds in translation, that the strict character of Russian laws is compensated by no necessity of uh, following them. So people always think, ah, oh, well, maybe it'll be all right. Um, and um, maybe this is um, the main explanation why they're not so active. And uh, professionals, they know already <laughs> that uh, um, this can be a, a source of real problems and um, so they're just more experienced. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, that I didn't ask you? Yeah, may maybe one thing I want to um, to underline. Maybe. Um, 
as I said, there are several deputies who are um, not just against this set of amendments, but they really try to stop it. They, they do something about it. And uh, one of them is um, Alex Molin from the Communist Party. Uh, however, I think he's not a member of the Communist Party, but he was elected uh, in, from the list of the Communist Party. Um, and um, he put an argument in the discussion at the um, council, uh, at the committee um, in the parliament, which I didn't appreciate from the very beginning, but uh, then I realized that it's a very good thing. Uh, he's, mm, by, by the way, he's a science, he's, uh, he had a degree in philosophy, I think. Uh, and maybe it explains why he pays attention to such things. He said that you actually cannot, uh, well, he said to authors of this document that he cannot use this wording because in the Russian history, this uh, word related to enlightenment has uh, only positive connotations. And uh, if you want to fight with uh, foreign uh, influence, you have explicitly to write it, but you cannot put restrictions on this, on the enlightenment. Uh, and then I realized that this is really so, because um, uh, it, it really sounds like uh, good people should not uh, do good things, which actually uh, finally do something evil. And uh, it might be regulated by, by officials. Um, you uh, have to use different approach even to words, but using different approach to words means a uh, different approach to thinking because always we're thinking with words. And I think uh, that, uh, okay, it's important. I appreciate now this argument, but it also illustrates um, the approach of the authors of this um, set of regulations how they think about. So they really think that everything we, which uh, we, uh, well, by definition, uh, accept as, uh, as good, as um, you know, rational, um, positive, uh, it can be the source of problems and you have regulate everything and use exactly this wording. And um, of course we have to avoid it because uh, society cannot, uh, society can live uh, with uh, many, many different restrictions. There's no problem with living, but it cannot develop. And, um, and to develop, to evolve is necessary because we, we know these species we did, which didn't adapt, <laughs> they, um, they don't exist anymore. Um, and uh, if we don't want to to join the the set of extinct uh, extincted species we we have to evolve and uh, many uh, regulations uh, always make uh, problems for these developments because uh, some often you have to react rapidly and if you have um, some bounds then uh, it'll take some time to understand that uh, you have to get rid of them and uh, then you lose your time use your chance to evolve thank you yeah i think that's very apt and it really is only through sort of open conversation and discourse that we can sort of evolve um and develop and i also know that from a personal perspective um studying and living in russia was extremely important for me and really sort of changed the way that I looked at Russia. Um, and I think that sort of communication between Russia and the rest of the world is essential for sort of mutual understanding. Um, and so I think that this law is very dangerous from a number of perspectives. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, and um, we really are hoping that this, these amendments don't pass. In many respects, the, the situation in, in Russia um, looks similar for me with the situation in Hungary. Mm. Uh, 
um, can, can you say what, what's your opinion? Because uh, all these deputies in all their um, speeches, they immediately mentioned Soros and Soros was the <laughs> number one to um, be expelled from Orban's uh, Hungary. Um, does it look similar or there are significant differences in your opinion? If, uh, so you I, I'm not, I don't know um, in detail that much about Hungary, but I do remember when there was the issue of the European University in Hungary um, mm -hmm. and general sort of um, restrictions on academic freedom, which I think are similar. Um, I, I don't, it, it seems, I, I, I don't know the details of um, the, legislation in Hungary, but I do think that this law in Russia seems, from what I understand, more expansive. Um, I do think some of the rhetoric, though, about foreign influence um, is similar, um, which is sort of unsettling and um, disturbing. And it sounds like what I, I was watching an interview that you gave, um, or in Russian and you were talking about the conversation at, um, I think it was the civic chamber um, when there was discussion about this law. And you said that the person, I think there was one person who um, introduced the law and basically said that the reason for it was this sort of foreign influence. Um, and I think that that sounds very similar to what's going on in Hungary, though I don't sort of know the details fully. I think maybe it already happened in one place and we can yeah, yeah. learn something from it. Well, I know they were fight with the, the European University, um, but I, I think that in some ways that was uh, specific maybe to the university. Um, and this seems much broader, um, but it's, it's definitely something that would be interesting to look into. It, it seems like, you know, in general there's, um, it, what's happening in Russia is not sort of isolated um, and sort of, it seems like when there are repressions, they often target academics and sort of free sort of discourse. So I think that it's definitely important to look at Russia in the context of other countries. But there is one um, context which I, which I don't feel, so I um, cannot really speak about it. I, I can only ask about it. Because in Hungary, it also looks like um, um, for Orban, maybe, uh, the European University is uh, the, the source of, say, near future political elite uh, oriented more to um, United Europe, to the European Union, I mean. And uh, actually, they want to, to cancel it to um, just not to have a new generation of people so um, Euro European in mind, I would say. Um, I don't know if uh, particular these problems in Russia are somehow related to similar cases because uh, it can be that it's uh, maybe, it's definitely my um, imagination, not uh, just against uh, real, I mean, real present day opposition, which actually is a very minor group of people. And um, I've well, fortunately or not, unfortunately, I would say separated from the, the main public. Uh, so they live in a very, their own world, I would say. Um, but also there are uh, educational organizations, uh, starting from some good schools, uh, which always try to invite people to, to make very open to the world and then going to universities who actually produce finally this new intellectual elite uh, of the country. And if it is actually part of uh, this, this approach to, 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 to stop uh, this part or, or not, because uh, maybe I'm thinking, how say, trying to think too deep. I, Thank no, I, th I think question. it makes sense. It, you know, it definitely, it's, that probably is part of the approach, but it seems, you know, it, it's interesting that the Russian law is also very much focused on science, um, which is often a sort of more, it, it's not, I mean, it, it would affect the humanities as well, but I think it's interesting that um, it would also affect sciences, which is sort of generally 
more apolitical in some sense, although I guess in the Soviet Union you had a lot of... These amendments are more about values than about science, and uh, but, but the problem is that doing science, we uh, doing just well uh, our scientific job. We are based on some set of values. And it sounds like uh, old fights, uh, which was not actually between science and religion. Uh, we well know that there are many scientists who are very religious. And it was uh, five centuries ago, it's also now, but uh, definitely they use other values. And uh, they can be whatever, Muslims, Christians, whatever they like. But when it comes to something you can really look at, discuss, analyze, uh, they use their values. And here it's the same thing. And uh, just if we, uh, um, it, it works, maybe it's not the best example, but still, uh, uh, if you have two books and you can just quickly read something about the authors and you know that one author is from, I don't know, Harvard, uh, then probably say, well, it sounds good. I'll, I'll take it. And it's about particle physics. I don't know about chemistry, whatever. But the same approach would work also for, I don't know, political science. Uh, and, um, and this is something uh, which goes against values of uh, some people said, no, 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 th this is different. <laughs> uh, when you think about your particles, uh, you can do whatever you like, maybe, at least still you can do whatever you like. Uh, but when we come to political issues or to economy or to, I don't know, social science and so on, uh, it's not. We have our own values and we'll develop them, but it doesn't work that that way. Uh, I don't know how in 20th, well, after <laughs> the middle 20th century, you can uh, develop anything in this field without, I don't know, French philosophers, for example. You, you just cannot cut it from the history of thinking. And uh, if it goes against your values, you have to rethink your values. That, that's the point. And we clearly see it in normal, well, normal, <laughs> in natural science. Sorry, I'm an astrophysicist here. Yeah. Um, in natural science, and um, yes, we, we can shift it. Uh, we can use the same approach to more or less everything. And um, that, that's the problem. And then such... Um, modifications of the law of education, this is an important issue. They clearly shows that uh, people have different set of values and um, just normal. We know that the problem is that we know how the science develop. <laughs> And uh, we easily understand that the same approach goes to social sciences at least. And for humanitarians, definitely there are some specifics about it, but for social science it works. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think sort of the values of um, open communication and free speech are just absolutely essential to the development of science or the humanities. And um, so this law just seems very um, short-sighted and counterproductive for the, which it'll sort of halt the free development of these um, disciplines. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this thank was you. an incredibly informative um, and interesting conversation, um, and I hope that we can continue it in the future. Free speech.